When military crises erupt around the globe, the U.S. Army calls on its rapid reaction forces to put boots on the ground quickly. One of the best known units of these elite forces is the 82nd Airborne Division. Parachutes were invented to save airmen in the event of problems with their aircraft. In the 1930s, several armies began experimenting with them for military operations. By World War II, a new type of soldier emerged, the paratrooper. Today, the 82nd Airborne Division is an essential element of the U.S. Army's Rapid Reaction Forces. During Operation Warrior Sweep in July 2003, it was the 82nd who helped rout out Taliban and Al-Qaeda forces from their mountain hideouts in Afghanistan. This operation highlighted a primary mission requirement of the division, the need to be able to deploy a combat-ready force at a moment's notice. The mission of the 82nd Airborne Division is to deploy anywhere in the world within 18 hours of notification, conduct a parachute assault, conduct follow-on combat operations in support of the national objective. And what that means is the division has the ability to be deployed and inserted into a hostile environment without a secure airfield to support its operations. The 82nd Airborne Division maintains a rapid reaction capability through vigorous peacetime training. Always prepared, the division maintains a portion of its forces called the Division Ready Force on an alert status, ready to go into action anywhere around the globe. With its proud history and demanding mission, the 82nd Airborne has long been considered one of the U.S. Army's elite formations. The 82nd has been able to meet its requirements by depending on volunteer soldiers. The troopers of the 82nd Airborne Division are twice volunteers. They first volunteer to come into the Army, then they volunteer to become an Airborne soldier. He has to pass the, the test, uh, so to speak, in order to come into the Division. First, he successfully passes his basic and uh, advanced infantry training, and then he must go through the grueling Airborne School that uh, is part of uh, the United States Army. So that twice volunteer status makes him a unique and highly uh, motivated soldier. World War II saw the first extensive use of airborne forces. The U.S. Army's best known airborne divisions in World War II were the 101st Screaming Eagles and the 82nd All-Americans. These early airborne units used two methods of delivery into combat zones. The best known and most widely used technique was the parachute. But the divisions also could deliver a portion of their troops as well as heavy equipment by gliders, towed behind transport aircraft and released near the landing zone. The 82nd's first airborne operation was during the 1943 invasion of Sicily, followed by later combat actions at Salerno and Anzio in Italy. The 82nd and 101st took part in the massive airborne attacks that initiated the D-Day invasion of Normandy in June 1944. Their last major airborne drop of the war took place in the Arnhem operation in the Netherlands, where the 82nd Airborne seized the Nijmegen Bridge.
In the post-war years, the technology of troop insertion began to change with the advent of the helicopter. Helicopters, rather than parachutes or gliders, could deliver forces deep behind enemy lines. The 101st Airborne was converted over to a heliborne force, now called the 101st Air Assault Division. But parachutes still have their place in modern warfare. Limited by the range of the helicopters, Helleborn forces can be delivered only a few hundred miles. Paratroopers can be delivered to objectives much further, since their transport aircraft have ranges of several thousand miles. The difference between the 101st and the 82nd, we're both in the same contingency corps. And once we're on the ground, physically on the ground, our capabilities in the infantry battalions are very similar. The significant difference is the training time that it takes to be a paratrooper, insertion by a parachute, uh, as compared to insertion by helicopters. We both have to focus on that entry technique, and uh, those require some intensive training, both at the individual level and at the uh, command levels. When going into a combat jump, the paratrooper is heavily burdened with equipment. Over his regular combat equipment webbing, the paratrooper wears a special harness. The main parachute is attached to the rear of this harness and is designed to land the paratrooper safely even during jumps from under 1,000 feet. In front, the paratrooper attaches a reserve parachute. The airborne soldier's individual weapon is carried in an M1950 weapons case. The soldier's Alice pack, or rucksack, is suspended off the front of the harness. In total, the paratrooper carries about 150 to 180 pounds of equipment. The T-10 Bravo and Charlie parachutes are 35 foot in diameter, and they fall at a rate of descent of approximately 15 feet per second. This allows paratrooper to land safely. That parachute is also designed to bring 350 pounds safely to the ground. It is also designed to open quickly and the division jumps at low altitudes, so that parachute has to act as designed every time. When inside the aircraft preparing to jump, the paratrooper's static line is attached to the anchor line in the aircraft. Upon jumping, the weight of the paratrooper breaks a pack-closing tie when the end of the 15-foot static line is reached. When this happens, the parachute deployment bag comes free of the pack tray. Two connector link ties break, and the suspension lines are pulled out of the stow loops of the deployment bag. Finally, two locking stows disengage, and the canopy is pulled from the deployment bag. The entire process takes about four seconds from exiting the aircraft to full inflation of the parachute's canopy. that lowers your equipment. It's a lowering line. What it does is it attaches to your Alice pack, routes it through your M1950 weapons case, and then to a D-ring that's attached to the main parachute harness. This allows you to have more freedom of movement to curl up into your uh, prepared and land attitude when you get ready to conduct your POF. Keeping the equipment on you causes damage to the equipment and possibly injure the uh, parachute itself. The inherent risk in parachute jumps has led to a series of overlapping safety features during airborne operations. One of the most obvious methods is the reserve parachute worn by the paratrooper. The reserve parachute is the backup system for that main parachute should it fail. 
Its canopy is smaller in size. It's a 24 foot diameter canopy. Its opening is aided with a pilot parachute. And it opens very quickly. Its rate of descent is somewhat faster. It will not bring down as much weight, but it, it's designed to open super quick. So if he has a problem, he's got a life-saving device right there in front of him. Since airborne operations are conducted from low altitudes, every effort is made to ensure that the main chute operates every time. Preparing parachutes for operations is the responsibility of the Division Supply and Transport Battalion. Our process of ensuring that we have a safe parachute is a parachute from the time it's taken off the drop zone and shaken from, to the packing procedure back onto the back of a paratrooper going out of an airplane is inspected no less than five times. So that parachute undergoes a tremendous amount of scrutiny before it ever goes back on somebody's back. During training operations, the paratrooper bundles the parachute into a kit bag after the drop. Bundling the parachute after jumps is the first step in ensuring that the parachutes remain undamaged and safe to use. Once a parachute is recovered from the drop zone by the unit that has jumped the, the parachute, it is taken to the shakeout facility, which is adjacent to the pack facility, and it's shaken out to make sure that all debris is removed from the parachute and they attempt to remove any tangles uh, in the suspension lines in order that when the parachute comes to us, it's able to be packed uh, with ease. Uh, once it's through being shaken out, they send it to our, the pack facility and it is then inspected by a, a parachute rigger and packed. The PAC facility at Fort Bragg is the largest of its kind in the U.S. Armed Forces. The paratroopers' safety is the platoon's key concern. There's one parachute rigger that packs the parachute. There's also an in-process inspector working with that rigger who lays out the parachute and ensures that it is in proper layout for the uh, rigger. And while he or she is packing the chute, that same in-process inspector is inspecting the parachute while it's, while it's being packed. Once it has been packed by that rigger, then it goes to a final inspector who gives it a final inspection. So basically what you have is one soldier packing the parachute and two additional parachute riggers that are inspecting it while he or she is packing it. There's a log record book that is attached to every parachute and it identifies the serial number of the parachute and of the deployment bag and the packer who packs the chute signs it as well as the final inspector who inspects the, the parachute signs it as well. So that's our way of being able to track who packed it. They know that every time they sign their name to a chute that we know who did it so it's a little bit of a gut check for them also. Although the 82nd Airborne is primarily a light infantry force comprised of about 14,000 soldiers, its task forces include a variety of heavy equipment to support the paratroopers during combat missions. A battalion task force in this division consists of approximately 730 soldiers. The basis for the task force organization is the infantry battalion. Uh, but also assigned to the task force is an artillery battery consisting of six 105 howitzers, an engineer platoon, an air defense platoon, a military police squad, and a military intelligence element. This heavy equipment has to be dropped into the landing zone along with the paratroopers. This can range in size from single containers of ammunition and other supplies, all the way up to armored vehicles. The 82nd uses a variety of special techniques to ensure that the heavy loads will arrive safely in the drop zone. These troops are preparing a Humvee five-quarter ton truck for a parachute drop. The ring for a Humvee consists of a 16-foot platform. That's a large aluminum platform made up of different panels, side rails, and end boards, which are just components of the platform. That's a, like the base. Then on top of that, put honeycomb stacks. And what those are, are stacks configured to help cushion the shock on impact for the vehicle. Then the vehicle is actually lashed onto that platform and onto those honeycomb stacks. Again, that's just to make sure that as little damage is done to the vehicle as possible. Then additional honeycomb is put on top of the vehicle to make sure that nothing happens to it. Then we also have parachutes on top of that, two parachutes in the event of, a, in the case of a Humvee. Especially heavy loads such as armored vehicles require special attention. There are two methods for delivering such loads into the drop zone. 
We have a heavy drop, which normally would take eight G11 size parachutes, and they are loaded onto a platform and basically are pulled out of the aircraft, uh, this opening the parachutes, allowing for land. We have a LAPES operation, which is a low altitude parachute insertion, and this is basically where the aircraft flies real low, and the tank on the pallet is pulled from the aircraft and has somewhat of a rough landing, but it kind of slides across the, uh, the terrain or the ground. LAPES allow us for the delivery of especially large and heavy loads without the need for so many large cargo parachutes. However, it does demand considerable skill on the part of the airlift pilot. The C-130 will go down very low to the ground. The parachutes will come out and they'll act as an air anchor and uh, actually just pull the, the load out. Now the load's on a special type of platform with a special kind of nose on it that prevents the vehicle from tipping over as it as actually drags on the ground and is slowed down by the parachutes. Delivering the paratroopers to their distant objectives is the task of the U.S. Air Force's military airlift units. An important element in division planning is the close relationship between the airborne forces and the airlift squadrons. The 82nd Airborne's North Carolina base at Fort Bragg is co-located with Pope Air Force Base, home to several transport squadrons. Without the support of the Military Airlift Command, we would be incapable of conducting our mission. We enjoy a close relationship with the Air Force, with the close proximity of Fort Bragg and Pope Air Force Base. We train uh, literally on a daily basis with the Air Force. Uh, without them, uh, it would be very, very difficult for us to do our job. And it's important uh, that we really do operate in a joint environment uh, because of the close working relationship we have with the Air Force, because of the uh, operations we do in conjunction with the Marines, uh, we really operate in a joint environment. Delivering paratroopers is not as easy as it might seem. One of the greatest concerns is landing your forces in a very tight pattern, avoiding wide dispersion. This means that the airlift aircraft need to fly in close formation. This is further complicated by the fact that most drops are conducted in the darkness of night. Six Air Force C-141 star lifters fly in close formation. They will have to slow down to 130 miles per hour, nearly stall speed, to allow the paratroopers to jump safely. In close formation, wingtip vortices from leading aircraft are a particular danger, requiring each aircraft to fly lower than those following it. The approach to the drop zone is completely black, save a few markings. To line up on the drop zone and deliver the paratroopers requires great concentration from the Air Force crew and close cooperation with the soldiers of the Army's 82nd Airborne Division. Night drops may be difficult for the airlift crews, but they are a definite advantage to the paratrooper. The first combat jump for the 82nd Airborne since World War II was a nighttime jump in Panama, 1989. Going into Panama was an uh, experience. This for us was a uh, chance for the 82nd to conduct its first airborne operations in quite some time. So. Initially, everyone that was there were young, new faces. Looking around for some sort of confidence from other fellow mates was really non-existent. Basically, what you're looking at is everybody, it's first time for everyone. So there's really no one to look at other than the training that you've done all these years prior to it paid off for us. If you have a mission and that's on your mind, jumping into the nighttime is really a plus for you. So it, 
it's more of a, an asset than it is a of an enemy because yeah. for one it cuts down your possibility of getting spotted or seen so it, it's basically it's a it's a friend for you so I prefer to jump at nighttime the routine of an airborne jump has not changed much since World War II. As the paratroopers wait to board the aircraft, the traditional ritual of paratroopers takes place. The jump masters carefully check each soldier to make certain that no harness is out of place, no line tangled. Burdened by the heavy load of their parachutes and equipment, the airborne soldiers struggle out to the aircraft. It's not surprising that the 82nd Airborne places great importance on peak physical training for its troops. Once aboard the aircraft, the paratroopers settle in for the trip to the drop zone. For overseas deployments, it can be over 10 hours. Inside the cavernous hold of the aircraft, the paratroopers await the signal to get up and attach their static lines. No matter how careful the planning and how thorough the training, there is always an element of danger in parachute jumps. On approach to the drop zone, the pilot signals the jump masters in the rear of the aircraft, and the first line of paratroopers are soon exiting the aircraft. With its legendary heritage of heroic exploits, the 82nd Airborne Division has been the shock force of the U.S. Army since World War II. When crises arise, the Army depends on the All-Americans to deploy anywhere, at any time, and fight upon arrival.